What weighs 1,400 pounds, runs on sunlight, and is the fastest object made by humans in history? It's NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Launched in 2018, Parker's top speed is a jaw-dropping 430,000 miles per hour, fast enough to travel from New York to LA in about 20 seconds. The probe has also traveled closer to the sun than any other spacecraft, and it's just getting started. I'm really thrilled today to be speaking to Adam Sabo, the mission scientist for Parker Solar Probe, and to Betsy Congdon, who's the lead thermal protection system engineer for the mission at Johns Hopkins um, University Applied Physics Lab. Thank you both so much for talking to us. Hello. Thank you for having us. Well, I gotta say, uh, this is my favorite current mission. I love it so much. Um, perseverance is great and everything, but I'm way more interested in the sun. So I love Parker. And I just wanted to start by asking you, Adam, if you can tell us a little bit more about this mission and why it is such a groundbreaking mission in terms of solar science. I would love to. This is truly an exciting mission that we have been looking forward to executing for a really long time. It, go, The concept goes back to 1958 when there was a, a commission, a government commission chartered after the, the United States was able to enter into space and the question was raised, where should we go? And what are the critical questions that we need to answer once we are able to get into space? And the concept to get as close to the sun was right at the top even back then. So we are really excited that finally we reached the technological capability in the United States that we can put together such a mission to get as close as possible to the sun. So wow. one way to one way to think about it, uh, we'll put it on a on a football field uh, with the sun at one side and the earth at the other side. We're getting in the four yard line, we're getting really, really close. We're getting in that sun corona. So it's very exciting. Well, I have to ask, I mean, as the person who's responsible and your team is responsible for making sure that this thing just doesn't, you know, blow up or shrivel up into a little crisp. I mean, what are the challenges when you're in an environment like that? How hot is it? And um, how does the whole thermal protection system work? Yeah, so as we get close to the sun, we have a heat shield thermal protection system, which stays between the spacecraft and the sun at all times when we're close. And so what that means is while the heat shield is experiencing 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the spacecraft is sitting more like at 85. It's almost like it doesn't know it's at the sun. And that's the goal. Uh, we wanted to design the spacecraft um, and most of the instruments. Some of the, uh, some of the instruments are actually also out in the breeze, as I like to say. Um, but most of, the, most of them are, are protected behind the shadow or the umbra of the thermal protection system. Um, and so, yeah, so it's really hot and obviously all of the particles that are coming off the sun. But one of the challenges, as Adam was just discussing, is we're actually going there to study these things, right? So we don't know exactly what we're experiencing. So part of the engineering challenge and what made it so exciting was to actually figure out how to design something to explore something that you're trying to actually figure out and, and understand. And, and from what I understand as well, it's not only that you're going so close to this just like, you know, unprecedented object of exploration, but also then Parker will be swinging out into a very cold environment. So can you tell us about the contrast in temperatures that the, the protection system has to go through? Yeah, so actually, so it's, you know, seven year mission and there are 24 cycles going hot, cold, hot, cold. So right. So you're getting really hot. And then when you're out at Venus, we're using Venus actually as a gravity assist to get closer and closer to the sun. So it's really, really cool how over a 24 years or 24 cycles in seven years, we're actually getting closer and closer at these incremental points. Um, and so, so this the heat shield and um, the other components that were out uh, that are out on the spacecraft have to be designed to get really, really hot and really, really cold over a really long period of time, um, which obviously takes a lot of materials testing and understanding and um, showing that you can survive launch. And so. It's a lot of, of engineering and analysis that goes into making that possible. We have an issue that we also had to generate electricity mm. that runs seven years just on batteries. So uh, one would think that, well, that should be uh, not an issue. You should have plenty of solar light available to uh, run your solar panels, right? I mean, the sun is nearby, it's generating quite a bit of brightness, so you should have no problem. 
Well, it turns out there is such a thing as too much good. Uh, just like if you're thirsty and giving you a biohydrant might not be very helpful. So uh, our issue is that if you put a solar panel out this close to the sun into the breeze, it would melt rather mm -hmm. than generate electricity. So we had to come up with a technology that is capable of still generating electricity. So uh, our solar panels are feathered. So as we get closer and closer to the sun, we bend it back to reduce the amount of light captured by them. And ultimately, we have to bring most of the solar panel behind the protection of uh, the heat shield that Betsy worked on. Uh, and we have just a little bit of flap of it that is sticking into a partial view of the sun. So we are only allowing a little bit of the edge of the sun's light uh, to fall on a tip of the solar panel. And that's how we survive and still generate electricity. If you think about it, if you're looking at a field and you see a flower across the field, there's a lot you can kind of determine about that flower, like looking at it across the field. Um, but actually going up and touching it, you get a completely different sense of like, what is this flower? And so that's what we're really trying to do. And that's so exciting. I like to say like in, you know, seven years and at the end of this mission, we're going to rewrite the science textbooks when it comes to the sun, which is just amazing. I mean, it, it's just so special to be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I can't wait to read the new textbooks on this for sure. And I think, you know, Betsy, I, I wanted to ask you also, you know, it, one of the things I find so cool about the mission is that by the end of it, it will be the fastest moving object, right? It will the, ever made by humans. Yep. So could you talk a little bit about how fast it's going to go? And is it those gravity assists that's making it accelerate to that speed? Yes. Yeah, so um, at closest approach, we're going to be at 430,000 miles per hour, uh, which <laughs> I think is probably a little like nobody was like, ah, oh, what's that? So that's fast enough to get from D.C., uh, where I am right now, to Tokyo in under a minute. That's how fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> so, I mean, the technology, we've discussed some of the, the heat shield as well as the solar ray cooling. There's some amazing technology that went. Some of the other technology actually that made this mission possible is like the mission design using Venus um, to as a gravity assist and, and using the sun and thinking about ways of really that was really revolutionary to like the actual mission profile it is. And so and yes, that's that's one of the reasons we're going so fast. We actually launched on the biggest rocket at the time. We are a very small uh, spacecraft on that very large rocket so that we got enough energy to start out really fast. And then over time, we are using Venus uh, to get closer and closer to the sun and, and that hel helps us get even faster. But um, so we've already broken the speed record. Um, and and yeah, and four, 430,000 is uh, miles per hour is what we expect to be. So it's really exciting. <laughs> For real. Can I add to that? Uh, yeah. to the neat thing is that uh, you asked that, so are we using Venus uh, uh, to accelerate us? The answer is that we are braking. So as Betsy said, that we really went and got the biggest rocket we could buy and put the smallest possible bird on top of it to get the, the most possible speed. But we use that speed to brake. Hmm. Because we are the... As we take off from Earth, we already have the speed of Earth to start with, to going around the sun. There is a reason the Earth doesn't fall into the sun, because we are going around so fast around the sun that we keep orbiting it in an almost perfect circle. So in order to go to the sun, what we have to do is break. So we use this big rocket and we stepped on the brake as much as we could to slow us so that we can fall in. The acceleration is provided not by the rocket, but by the gravitational pull of the sun. But we have to slow down so that we could fall in. So the, the sun is the accelerator and then out in the solar system is the braking system. That's pretty wild. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as you've been alluding to, the, the, the mission it has been going for a couple of years now. Um, could you kind of talk a little bit about what it's discovered so far and what are the big highlights you're looking forward to? What we refer to as switchbacks. These are unexpected uh, large turns in the observed magnetic field. Uh, it is a fairly involved uh, topic and uh, we still do not have a, a good explanation for it. it. These were completely unexpected wiggles in the technical term. Uh, for the 
<laughs> in the magnetic field observation, but it might indicate uh, something about how intermittent the solar wind generation is. So rather than a uniform whoosh out, that we have little bursts of solar wind that then congeals into what we see as a bulk flow. The other thing I would definitely encourage everyone to go and look at is there's some really fascinating pictures from one of our instruments, Whisper, um, that that are of the of the as as we're going around the sun. And there's just some fascinating pictures peeking out, looking out beyond the uh, heat shield, and seeing the stars and the and the phenomenon that are coming off the sun. I, I really encourage people to look. So that's um, as an engineer who had to design something that needed to last seven years and actually be on its peak performance at the end, uh, a little terrifying. <laughs> but for the scientists, it's uh, really fun. Yeah, um, yep. that's when the science gets good. But it's also, yeah, the result of all your work getting tested as well. Um, you know, I'd love to ask you too, um, both of you, uh, to to kind of weigh in on what this means for studying other systems. If there's any, you know, light that can be shed on that, because obviously the sun is the reason that we are all here. It's a huge part of life. Can learning about it help us understand the habitability of other star systems? So yeah, the sun is our star, right? It's the one that's closest to us. Um, and so as we understand it, we will understand many other you know, stars. Um, and so that's really exciting and will change our view, not only of our sun, but of all stars. <laughs>